My name is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm working for the Mises Institute, and we're doing a series of, of small videos, short videos, on our new book, Economics in One Listen. It's, of course, not a new book. It's a very old book by Henry Hazlitt. And it's my great pleasure to sit here with the, uh, with the scholar who wrote the introduction to the book, Walter Block. I'm delighted to be here with you, Jeff. It's just wonderful. So how do you think the book turned out? Do you like to look at it? Oh, wow. It's, it's uh, a labor of love. It's magnificent. Uh, this is one of my very favorite books of all bookdom, so to speak, and uh, it looks very good. I'm delighted that I was asked to write the introduction. And uh, I looked at it again, and I was amazed yeah. that me and Henry Hazlitt are now buddies. <laughs> it's just magnificent. So I was uh, so inspired by your last paragraph of your introduction. Do you mind if I read it, please? Yeah. And this takes away all your, your good stuff for this interview. But <clears throat> And so, here we go. Okay. In summary, I feel like a party host in introducing two guests to one another uh, who, hope, who hopes they will like each other. I hope you will like this book, but more, I hope it will affect your life in somewhat the same way it has mine. It has inspired me to promote economic freedom. Indeed, to never shut up about it. <laughs> yeah, very funny. It has convinced me that free market economics is as beautiful in its way as a prism a diamond, a sunset, the smile of a baby. We're talking the verbal equivalent of Mozart or Bach here. This book lit up my life, and I hope you get something a lot from it, too. So that's a very nice paragraph. Oh, you're very kind. Thanks. Uh, uh, that came right from the heart. Uh, I yeah. meant every word of it. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, this laissez-faire capitalism, free market, it's so unlikely to occur. I mean, you know, you've got Obama and you've you got McCain, and neither of them are laissez-faire economist types. And, we're, and poor Ron Paul, who is, uh, you know, was given the back of the hand by the American electorate. And they say, well, you know, it's so impractical. And one of my retorts, I have many, is that it's so beautiful. And even if it's never implemented, it's just so glorious, the, the idea of it. It's sort of like, I mean, I love Mozart and Bach, but I couldn't compose anything like that. And, and I couldn't appreciate, I'm not, I'm not a professional musician, but to me, Mozart and, and Bach and um, Hazlitt and Mises and Rothbard are all intertwined. They're, they're, even though, obviously, there are differences. Some work in words, others work in musical notes. But I see, uh, weirdo that I am, I see uh, great uh, connections between them. And I'm just honored to have been able to devote my professional life to creating beautiful music with words. Right. Now, there are obviously other retorts. Um, more practical ones. For example, no one expected the Berlin Wall to topple when it toppled. No one expected the Soviet Union to go belly up when it went belly up. And if we didn't have a plan as to how to privatize and how the market would work, it's as if we'd be caught with our pants down around our ankles. So even though right now in the U.S. things look gloomy for free enterprise, you know, Ron Paul experience, what have you, he didn't win, so far anyway, we can always hope. Uh, Maybe one day the uh, the Washington D.C. wall will fall, yeah. uh, similar to the Berlin Wall, and unless and until we have some sort of uh, understanding of free market economics, uh, we will be greatly embarrassed. Why do you suppose we need a book like this to help us understand economics? Well, this I think is the best introduction to economics of our type, Austro-Libertarian economics. I I know of no better introduction. I know of better um, uh, essays or uh, long written works like Human Action and Economy and State, but those are five, six, seven hundred uh, pages. This is I don't know, uh, 150 pages or something yeah, like that. How many pages is it? Let's see. Uh, it's 188. 89, and that includes the index. Okay, so yeah. without the index in my introduction, 150 isn't yeah. too far off. Maybe it's 170. So you can give it to someone and say, look, uh, read this as your first book. This is my first book in economics. Um, I was converted to uh, libertarianism by Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon. And Nathaniel Brandon, most of all, gave me two books. And he said, read these two books, and then we'll discuss them. Uh -huh. And one was this one, Economics in One Lesson. The other was Atlas Shrugged. Uh -huh. And in my introduction economics classes, I give my students what I was given. And 
it worked for me and and has worked for some of my students. Some of my students really get the message, and I think they get it from um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. So why is it that people can't just intuitively figure out economic science? By looking oh, around the world? oh no! I think that their intuitions are very much the opposite. Mm. Uh, every freshman class I get, uh, when I say that the minimum wage law is not really a good thing for the poor, they think I'm callous and unfeeling. Because obviously, you raise the minimum wage and everyone's better off. And, and you know, it's sort of like uh, the Grinch that stole Christmas to, to oppose that. Um, or rent, rent control lowers rents for poor people. And who could be against that? So instinctively good kids, 17, 18, 19-year-old freshmen, they're filled with the milk of human kindness, and they want uh, they want the poor to be helped, but they don't realize that uh, it it doesn't work. Now, could you uh, call upon that Pythagorean thing that you read oh, yeah. to me before well, we started out with you? Mm. Because that's very apropos to the point that I'm trying oh, to make. Oh, I'll probably never be able to find oh. it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's right here. Okay, right good. Here. So, yeah, so how's this talking about? Um, uh, well, about the Bastiat lesson concerning what you can see and what you can't see and how you can't always trust what you see. So he, he says, as a character in Bernard Shaw's St. Joan replies when told of the theory of Pythagoras that the earth is round and revolves around the sun. What an utter fool. Couldn't he use his eyes? Right. Sometimes, I mean, I think that's a beautiful passage and it really illustrates the, my answer to your question about uh, young students and why do they have why do they need this book why don't they instinctively see it their instincts are the very much opposite as it is I mean it looks as if the Sun revolves around the earth I mean it starts in the east and it goes to the west I mean, can't you use your eyes you dummy yeah. <laughs> you, know, you should be able to see that well in a similar way you have to do more than your eyes or more than a superficial look at minimum wage, at rent control, at tariffs and free trade and all the other issues that Hazlitt uh, goes through to see uh, beneath the surface. Yeah. And I think also sociobiologically we all are hardwired to accept explicit cooperation. You know, you're hurt, I'll, I'll soothe you, I'll, I'll get a cold compress oh. for you, what have you. But implicit cooperation through markets uh -huh. We're not uh, hardwired through biology to accept that. The uh, best example I can think of is I, I come from New Orleans. I teach at Loyola University, and we had Katrina. And right after Katrina, the prices rose of flashlight batteries and uh, candles and uh, orange juice and things like that. And everyone was saying, oh, they're price gougers, they're evil, uh, instinctively. Yeah. And when the governor of the state of Louisiana said, I'm going to put price gougers in price gougers in jail, everyone said, yeah, right on, you know, put those uh, so-and-sos in, into jail. It takes economics of the sort that economics in one lesson provides you to understand that there's a function of higher prices, namely it, it rations goods and it calls forth new supplies. Otherwise, all we can rely on is benevolence. We, we can't rely on self-interest. But most people are not hardwired to see that. They can't appreciate implicit cooperation, namely through prices and markets and profits and property rights and things like that. All they can uh, instinctively appreciate is charity. Okay, so Walmart brings in a whole bunch of things. That's good. Uh, uh, that would be like seeing the, the sun going, you know, uh, around the earth, or, or rather <laughs> the earth going around the sun. So I, I think the answer to your question is that people instinctively are anti-market yeah. and it takes an effort of will or understanding or knowledge of the sort that Henry Hazlitt so magnificently supplies to pierce through this ignorance. So let me ask about that. Why is it that there's only one economics and one lesson? Why is it, is it very difficult to write a book like this, a clean, clear, timeless introduction to economics? Why is that so difficult? Well, I think there are many. Uh, David Gordon has an introduction to yeah. economics. I think Callahan has one. There are others, but, you know, it's sort of like, why is there only one Mozart or one Bach? Well, there are others. I mean, yeah. there is Haydn and Salieri. Uh, <laughs> Salieri. I mean, there are, uh, my own book, uh, Defending the Undefendable, uh -huh. is sort of an homage to this. Sure. Uh, uh, at least the way I see it, uh, what they both have in common, and I'm not comparing the quality, but uh, just the, the motif, both have a, a main message and then 30 implications. Yes. For example, his main message is the lesson, my main message is the law of non-aggression, 
and then we both apply it to 30 places. So in a sense, when I wrote my book, Defending the Undefendable, I had this one in mind, right. only it was my seeing it through my eyeglasses. Now obviously the, these two books don't deserve to be mentioned even in the same sentence, but uh, but you know, if there's a Mozart and a Salieri, there can be a Hazlitt and a Block. I mean, yeah. all you can do is do your best. Yeah. And there are many of us at the Mises Institute right now, the, the faculty, uh, 12 of us or so, we're all trying to contribute. Now, none of us is a Hazlitt, none of us is a, Mozart, is a Mozart or or a Mises or a Rothbard, but we're all doing our best and we're trying to uphold the um, the tradition. But how do you account for why the book still seems so fresh, even though it was written so long ago? In my introduction, what I said is that except for that crack about Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. uh, it, it looks as if it was ripped from today's headlines. Yeah, and, and if he would have just put Hillary instead of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you, you probably couldn't tell. I mean, the book first came out in, in 46. 46, yeah. And now it's uh, 2008. Uh, I think that's 52 years or something, or 62 yeah. years, 72 years. My math is a little weak. It's a long time. It's almost 100, soon it'll be 100 years. And that book will be as fresh in 2042 yeah. as it was in 1946. And apparently, uh, he, just, he just ripped it off. I mean, not ripped it off. He just banged it out. I yeah. Mean, he, he left the New York Times yeah. in a split. And he just sat down at the typewriter and wrote this out as, uh, and uh, didn't think anything much would come of it. Isn't that interesting? Well, he was inspired, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe he was channeling something higher than him. Who knows? I, I'm not a religious person, but uh, he might have been inspired or something. Yeah. Uh, it's just beautiful. You know, f forget about the content for the moment. I mean, the content is beautiful. Uh, it's perfect. There's no mistake. But the way he writes, I mean, uh, he was inspired. I mean, it's just so beautiful, just on an aesthetic basis, apart from the economic basis. Yeah. It's so well written. I mean, there are very few people who can write like that. Murray Rothbard was one. But the rest of us lesser beings, you know, uh, convoluted sentences and it's hard to understand, and relatively speaking, yeah. uh, to these uh, geniuses. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we had in mind when we put out the introduction is we wanted to make it a beautiful book, yeah. hardback, yes. and cheap. Yes. So, I don't know, maybe this has happened to you, but oftentimes I'll have people over to dinner, just guess, and we'll, the subject of economics will come up. And you don't want to waste the whole dinner talking about economic theory. Um, what? So what? Well, <laughs> oh, you do? How dare you? How dare you say that? <laughs> no, you do want to do that, right? Okay. Let's say you do, but you want to give them even more. I've always wanted to have a, a stack of these yes, in my house. Yes, so I can say, sure. oh, by the way, here, let me yeah. just go. Oh, please take it. Take it with you. Yeah. And so that's the idea, you know, is that you can have, you can own some and give them up. Lou Rockwell gave a brilliant speech at one of the uh, Mises uh, seminars. I forget in what city. I, I've been to so many, they all blend together. And what he said is you're at a dinner party and everyone's nice and everyone's talking about, you know, the weather or the, the sports or something. And all of a sudden someone says something like, you know, uh, we got to have protective tariffs. And, and, and you know, you, your uh, spoon is halfway to your uh, mouth and you sort of, uh, what? And I, I think that would be a perfect antidote to that. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't have to, um, what's the expression, don't get mad, get even? <laughs> <laughs> don't lose your soup uh, halfway to your lip, but uh, just resolve that after the dinner is over, uh, you say, you know, you might be interested in this book. Yeah. And if you've got a stack of them, and what do they sell for? Uh, I think it's tw like $12. $12. Well, at today's prices, that's like uh, three gallons of gas or something, you know. You, you can give them, not promiscuously, but, you know, uh, on a needed basis. Right, once you see a spark of interest and say, right. well, here's, here's an issue you need to confront, which is namely, right. namely economic logic. Yeah, and yes. And you can, you can uh, hold whatever political views you want, but you need to think about, think about the economics behind it. Yeah, another title for that book that would have been good would have been Economic Logic in One Lesson. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted other titles that would be equally good or yeah. roughly yeah. as good. I mean, I, I'm not changing the title, I'm not for that, but Economic logic, I think, is a very good way of putting it. Do you suppose that it's one of the best-selling economics books that's ever been printed? I think it is. Uh, uh, I, I know that um, Atlas Shrugged is um, a magnificent yeah, bestseller, sure. and sure. it came out in '56, mm. and it's still selling yeah. by the bushel load. 
uh, but it's not really an economics book, although it is, but it's a novel. But this is a, a, not a novel, and, and Hazlitt has written novels. Yes. Uh, this is just a, a textbook, a very short textbook. I use it uh, in my classes as an adjunct to uh, you know a mainstream textbook and you know say here's the, the good stuff and a lot of times this attracts the student interest in a way that the dry textbook uh, it's nice doesn't. to compare them isn't it to have yes. them both yeah, absolutely yeah thank you so much Walter for not only for writing the introduction but for agreeing to this uh, quick interview oh it's my pleasure Jeff. <laughs>